Hey Optomancers, Chris here. So in the past couple weeks we've talked about spells for Eldritch Knights and for Arcane Tricksters and I said I would be doing builds for each of those subclasses and so we're going to start that today with our look at the Eldritch Knight. Now I want to just be upfront to begin with that if you want to make the best Eldritch Knight for doing damage at level 1 you basically you need to take a Varian Human. You gotta take a Varian Human, take the Polar Master Feet or the Crossbow Expert Feet. Then you're gonna use a Hand Crossbow or an Applicable Polar. That's gonna give you your best damage from level 1. As we move up in levels, that isn't gonna matter so much. Uh, especially once we get into 7th level and beyond, we're going to see less and less advantage from going that route. And I don't want to always make my characters very inhumans. Sometimes I want to play different races. And what I've been wondering is, is there a good way to make a halfling into a decent melee character? Uh, because with halflings, those are my favorite race. Anyone who's a fan of this channel already knows halflings have always been my favorite race. Can we make an effective melee halfling build? And Eldritch Knight is the way to do that. Once I punch the math, I realize that Eldritch Knight is the way to make an effective halfling melee build if we're going with fighter. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Today I'm going to be showing you a halfling build, but I will just point out to begin with that if you want to be doing more damage at lower levels, you're better off with Variant Human and go with one of those feats I suggested. Now before we get into this build, I want to thank some of my patrons. These are Archmage level patrons who are really supporting my channel. So today I want to call out Airhead, Alistair, Awesome Face, Bloody Nine, Christian Windham, Yunru, Dash Panther, and Dave Peters. Thank you so much for your support. Anyone who's interested in looking at my Patreon, there is a link in the video description that discusses the different rewards of the various levels you can join. But that said, let's get looking at an Eldritch Knight build for a halfling that I think works reasonably well. So before we get in too far, I just want to discuss what kind of results we're going to expect with this build. So whenever I'm looking at a build that is expected to do damage as part of the role it's going to be fulfilling in combat, I take a look at a baseline that I use, which is based on a Warlock using Hex, using Agonizing Blast, and maximizing their Charisma, and using Eldritch Blast. And that is the blue line you see on this graph. The red line you see is the build we're going to be making today. And as you can see, this build does dip below the baseline at level 2, just want to make that clear right off the bat. If we're not going to go very inhuman, we're not going to take Polar Master, we're not going to take Crossbow Expert, and we're going to be using a shield, we can expect to dip at level 2. Level 2 is not the point where this build takes off. At level 3 onward though, this character is going to be delivering above the baseline damage. So we're going to be an effective damage dealer at level 1, and once again reaching an effective damage dealing point at level 3. There's just going to be that one blip on the radar where we're not going to be all that effective with damage. So if I was doing a one shot and it was going to be second level, this is not the build I'd be using. But if we're going to be doing a long term campaign, I can handle one level where I'm a little bit below baseline. Where we really see this build take off is level seven. Level seven and then level eight we see another boost and we're going to stay well above the baseline right through to 20th level with this build. Another thing we're going to find with this build is this is a build that is going to use their spells. And you're going to find that there is a lot of tactics involved. And unlike with a base fighter that is usually just attack, 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 we're going to see a lot of decision making on which spell we're going to use when. Another thing to note when we're talking about calculating damages, there's some basics I always use. I assume eight combats a day. I assume one short rest in the middle. That isn't necessarily going to be your experience. You might find that there are less combats a day. You might find there are more short rests. I assume four rounds per combat. You might find combats are longer than that or shorter than that. Uh, that's just what I use basically because it lines up most with my own personal experience. Uh, but if you found that you were doing less combats per day or you found that you were doing less rounds per combat or more short rests, we'd probably find things like action surge having a bigger impact. We might even find this character exceeding your baseline at level two. But my baseline, it did not exceed. Last thing I want to mention is 
Because we are going to be playing a halfling, we're going to be dealing with halfling luck. Halfling luck means that when we roll a one, whether we're doing an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, we can re-roll. What ends up being a relatively small damage boost at every level, but it is a damage boost. A halfling is going to deliver more damage because of halfling luck. So let's take a look at the first level build here. I'm calling this a wee eldritch knight. We're not going to need any of our fancy source books here. No critical role, no magic, no Eberron. We are going to be using the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, and we will be using Xanathar's. Now the subrace I'm going to choose for Halfling is Stout Halfling. This is going to be the best choice for this build. Plus 2 to Dexterity, plus 1 to Constitution. Those are good starting ability scores for this character. We do not need a bonus to Intelligence for an Eldritch Knight. And the reason is, is because... Most of our spells are not going to be reliant on our intelligence at all. We're going to have a couple that are. Uh, they're not going to be spells we're going to be casting a lot. Still, I want to have a decent intelligence because there are a couple spells I will occasionally cast that will involve intelligence, so I don't want to dump it. But it doesn't need to be a 16 to start. Halfling gives us some great racial features as well. Lucky is one of my favorite racial features in the game. Probably my favorite racial feature in the game, though I'm not convinced it's mechanically the most powerful, but mechanically it is strong. And that is basically anytime you roll an attack roll, a saving throw, or an ability check, and you roll a 1, you get to re-roll. And that's just lovely to do because 1s are so disappointing in gameplay, and constantly, constantly, I am playing and people are disappointed with 1s, and I'm like, you should have played a halfling. Second thing we're going to get is Brave. We're playing a fighter. We don't want to be running away from combat because we're frightened of the enemy. Brave is going to help us with that. It's going to give us advantage on any saving throw we make against being frightened. And this isn't just spells. This is also things like the frightening ability of dragons, for example. Halfling Nimbleness is a nice little ability that allows us to move through occupied spaces as long as they're occupied by something larger than us. This includes enemy spaces. And then Stout Resilience is another reason we want to play the Stout Halfling. It involves a resistance to poison damage and advantage on saving throws against poison. And poison comes up in D&D. You will definitely make use of Stout Resilience with your character. So a lot of good features here. Stout Halfling is a strong choice for us. Obviously Fighter at level 1. The proficiencies I'm going to start with are Athletics and Perception. I think Perception is the most used skill in the game. And Athletics is going to be based on an ability score that's not good for us, and that's part of the reason I want it. Uh, I don't always want to just ignore things that are weak, I want to build them up. And athletics is something, as a fighter, once in a while we're going to be able to need to do. At least with the athletics proficiency, I will have a bonus on my roll rather than a negative on my roll. The fighting style I'm going to choose is dueling. This is going to be something I'm going to be using with a rapier. This is going to give me a plus two to damage whenever I hit. And then, finally, I'm going to be getting Second Wind. Second Wind is going to be a bonus action to use. Gives us a healing amount of D10 plus our level. At low levels, this is really effective. At high levels, not so much anymore. It's still okay to have. It's never a bad thing. But I do find that because the scaling is so slow at higher levels, just as a percentage of our total hit points, it's going to become lower and lower and lower. Ability scores, we get to take a bit of a luxury here because we are getting that bonus to dexterity and constitution, we're going to be able to start with a 16 in both. This is using a point by, but we could also achieve this with a stat array. Uh, our intelligence we're going to be able to have at 14. We could live with a lower intelligence here if we needed to, and I'm going to go be going for a 12 in wisdom, and that's because occasionally you do make wisdom saving throws. We have advantage against being frightened. That does not mean we're going to automatically succeed on those saving throws. So at least with a Wisdom of 12, we're going to start with a bonus. This isn't enough. Not enough in the long term. We're going to be making Wisdom saving throws. We're going to be failing. So at some point, we're going to want to shore that up as well. Strength and Charisma, we are going to dump. Any background works for this character. I took the Urchin background. It's going to give us Sleight of Hand and Stealth. Now, when it comes to equipment, I suggest you roll for gold with this character. And that's because a fighter's base equipment is going to let you choose from leather or chain mail. But we actually want to start with the medium armor, likely scale mail. So I suggest rolling for gold, buy your scale mail, buy your shield, buy your rapier. And if you have enough extra, buy a hand crossbow or a short bow. When we get to fifth level, we want to switch to a short bow anyway. Ranged is not the specialty for this character. We will be okay 
at ranged. Because we're going to have a good dex, we're not going to be bad at it, we're going to get extra attack, we're going to be able to use that with a short bow, but we don't have the archery combat style, we're not going to be taking any of the archery feats. So this is something we're going to fall back on when we need to. And at first level, we have a perfectly capable fighter. Good armor class, good hit points, good constitution score, plus 5 to hit, d8 plus 5 damage, nothing wrong with that at first level. Now hopping up to third level, there's going to be something that happens at second level, and that's Action Surge. Action Surge is usable once per short rest and can give you an additional action. This means we can deliver some additional damage with this character. Based on my calculations, Action Surge is not enough at second level to bring us over the baseline. And that's largely based on the fact that I'm looking at 16 rounds between each Action Surge. It may be a lot less rounds depending on the campaign you're in. So this character might be capable at damage at second level depending on your campaign. But in my calculations, it's not until third level. At third level, we're going to be getting Eldritch Knight. First thing we're going to get is Weapon Bond. What Weapon Bond does is if our weapon is not in our hand, we can use our bonus action to put it in our hand. The way this can be useful to us is if we want to cast a spell that's going to require a somatic component, we can drop our weapon on the ground or sheathe it then we cast our spell, use our bonus action, and it appears in our hand again. Now a lot of DMs will let you drop your weapon on the ground and pick it up using your interact with an object. It really just depends on your DM. More importantly though, we're going to have some spells that are going to require somatic components and our reaction. So what this means is we actually don't want to be holding our weapon when it's not our turn. What I recommend with this character is that we actually sheathe our weapon after our turn. And then at the beginning of our next turn, that's when we're going to use our bonus action to summon our weapon, tack with it, sheathe it again. This is not something we're going to want to be doing for the entire length of this character. It works for now. But we are going to be wanting to get the Warcaster feat, uh, and that's going to prevent us needing to do this. And we are eventually going to want to be able to be making opportunity attacks, and we can't really do that until we get the Warcaster feat. We're going to get two cantrip selections, easy picks. Booming Blade, Green Flame Blade. We are a fighter. We want to have those melee cantrips, and they are absolutely essential for this build. Both Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade scale incredibly well. At 5th level, they're both going to add D8 to our initial attack and to the secondary damage, so the damage if somebody moves or the damage beside the enemy we're attacking. And at 11th level, they both scale by D8 again, and at 17th level, they both scale at d8 again. So a booming blade might do 78 extra damage at level 17. A green flame blade might do 68 extra damage plus 2 at level 17. And with a green flame blade we always know before we attack if we're going to get that additional damage. So when we know we definitely want to use green flame blade. But if we're not going to get the additional damage from green flame blade that's when we use booming blade because then we still might get that secondary damage. It's also important to note that Booming Blade is Thunder Damage, Green Flame Blade is Fire Damage, so if we are fighting a creature, and a lot of them exist that have resistance or immunity to fire, then Booming Blade is always going to be our choice. Very few things are resistant or immune to Thunder Damage. At third level, we're going to get three first level spells. Two of them must be from the Abjuration or Evocation schools. One can be from any school. This is a really easy choice because we can take three great spells here. The first one we're going to take is Absorb Elements. Absorb Elements is a reaction to cast, and whenever we're going to be taking energy damage, it's going to give us resistance to that damage. In addition, when we attack on the following turn, we will be getting an additional 1d6 damage type of that damage when we make our attack. Uh, now that's not the big deal. The big deal is actually the resistance to damage. Dragons are infamous for being able to do massive amounts of energy damage. Absorb Elements is huge when facing dragons. Second spell we're going to take a shield. Shield is again really nice on this character. Now we could be taking as well a feat called Defensive Duelist that would allow us to add our proficiency bonus to our armor class against a single attack using our reaction. Shield is better. Shield is going to allow us to add plus 5 to our armor class, again, after an attack roll is made. And that plus 5 is going to last until our next turn. So we are going to be able to have that plus 5 apply to potentially several attacks. That's just much, much better than getting the bonus to a single attack. So it's worth the spell slot to cast shield. And frankly, I don't think it's worth the feat slot 
for this character because we have shield to get defensive duelist. And finally, my favorite first level spell in the game, Find Familiar. This is an obvious choice for this character. A familiar can provide you the help action. We have one attack per round that's going to be delivering a lot of damage using Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade. And that damage is going to get better and better and better. And that single attack is going to become more and more important. And a Find Familiar can provide us a way to get advantage on the attack if we don't have any other method of getting advantage. This character will have other methods of getting advantage on attacks, so we won't necessarily need our Find Familiar to get advantage, but Find Familiar is just one more way we can do it. And Find Familiar is useful in many other situations as well. It's great as a scout. It's great for getting a bird's eye view. Uh, Find Familiar is pretty much always something I'm going to take with first level spells when it's available. So at third level, once again, this character is delivering above baseline damage, and that's going to continue. We're always going to do decent or very good damage from now on. We still have good armor class. We still have good hit points. Let's jump this character to level 5. First, at level 4, we're going to get our first ability score improvement, and we could take Warcaster here, or we could increase our dexterity. Uh, whichever one we don't do, we're probably going to do at level 6. Uh, with this build, I'm going with the dexterity at level 4, but you could do the Warcaster. You're still going to just barely be above your baseline damage if you do that, uh, but this will help keep us a little bit more above that baseline damage when things are a little bit rocky. Once we get to level 7, we're going to see our damage per round really take off, so I am more inclined to have that Warcaster a little closer to that. Uh, so for now, I'm recommending the Dexterity score. Remember, it's not just helping our damage, it's also helping our initiative and our saving throws. We're also getting one additional first level spell. This comes at fourth level. I'm recommending here Thunder Wave. Uh, Thunder Wave uh, is a good way to do some extra damage if we have multiple enemies in a small area. Most of the time we're better off just with our base attack. But if we have, say, five goblins all bundled together, we might be able to hit them all with a Thunder Wave. That's going to be more effective than our base attacks. We also have the advantage of potentially pushing somebody back, though I wouldn't count on enemies failing our saving throws. Our DC isn't terrible. It's probably one lower than a primary spellcaster at this point, but at these low levels, even primary spellcasters aren't counting on enemies failing their saving throws. Now at level 5, we get extra attack. This is normally a very big deal for a fighter uh, because it allows you to attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action. So the question is, is this character better off using the extra attack or are they better off using Green Flame Blade or Booming Blade? Because remember, both those cantrips scaled at level 5 as well. And when I did the calculations, I determined that this character is doing about 16.81 damage if they attack twice, but if they use Booming Blade, they're getting 18.6 damage. So we're actually better off using Booming Blade than we are doing that second attack. Only time I'd really do the two attacks is if I really felt that an enemy was unlikely to move and we can't get the additional damage off a Green Flame Blade. So I want to hop two levels here. We're going to go to level 7, but first let's talk about level 6. What's going to be happening at level 6 is we're going to be getting our ability score increase. And we really do want to get Warcaster on this character, so let's do it now. It's going to give us advantage on Constitution saving throws to maintain concentration. Now this character hasn't been concentrating on anything up to now, but we are going to be concentrating on more and more as we go up in levels. And I'm going to kind of go over, once we get to high level, we're going to be concentrating almost all the time. So getting that advantage on concentration saving throws when we take damage is definitely going to come up. Although this character has a good constitution save, it's not a guarantee. That advantage makes a big difference. The being able to perform the somatic components of spells also really useful for this character. More and more spells we're casting are not going to be able to be cast with a rapier and a shield unless we have the warcaster feat. And finally, when a creature does provoke an opportunity attack from us, we can do a booming blade on them instead of a regular rapier attack. That is going to increase our damage, although I haven't calculated opportunity attacks into the damage per round of this character because I don't expect them to be delivering a lot of opportunity attacks. But at 7th level, we get an absolutely massive ability for this character, and we're really going to see damage per round take off. And that is when we use our action to cast a cantrip, we can make one weapon attack as a bonus action. This jumps our damage per round by over 7 per round. 
At level 7, we're also going to get our first second level spell. It has to be from the Abjuration or Evocation schools, and I'm recommending Warding Wind. We're not concentrating on anything else yet. We just got Warcaster, so we're going to have advantage on concentration saving throws. So a long duration spell that uses concentration is actually a good choice for us here. And Warding Wind is an okay spell. It is going to give us some things like we can clear out fogs if we're nearby. This might affect our ability to get advantage on attack rolls, so that kind of thing can be useful. It is going to give ranged weapons disadvantage to attack us. Again, a useful ability, especially when you already have a good armor class. It's going to be hard for things like arrows to hit you. And it creates some difficult terrain for enemies. Uh, again, something that is sometimes useful, not always, it depends on the situation. But overall, Warding Wind is not a bad second level spell, and not a bad second level spell, especially for a melee character. Once we reach level 8 though, I'm probably not going to be casting Warding Wind anymore. First thing at level 8, we're going to get another ability score improvement, so now we can max out our dexterity. But a huge difference to our damage with this character is we're going to be able to select a second level spell from any school. We're definitely going to select Shadow Blade. Now, Shadow Blade uses a bonus action to cast. That means we can't use War Magic on the turn we cast the Shadow Blade. The Shadow Blade is going to give us a weapon that de delivers 2d8 psychic damage. That means that we're going to bypass almost every kind of resistance in the game. And when we attack a creature that is in dim light, we're going to get advantage on the attack roll. That's what we want to be doing. We want to be getting our enemies into dim light in order to attack them. This includes attack rolls we make with the War Magic ability. That means that starting on the second round of the combat, we are definitely going to be using Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade and then getting the additional attack with the Shadow Blade, potentially with advantage, for the 2d8 damage instead of the 1d8 damage from our rapier. Now the only question is, is on the first round of combat, are we better off doing a booming blade or green flame blade, or are we better off attacking twice using our extra attack feature? And the answer is, it's really close. I would probably do the green flame blade if I know I'm going to get that secondary damage. Otherwise, I'd probably do the extra attack, but it's not going to make a huge difference one way or the other. You can do whichever you want. But starting on the second round of combat, then we're going to be able to do the Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade and get the extra attack using our bonus action. So when do we want to use Shadow Blade? When we can get the lighting conditions right. So I would not be using Shadow Blade in the combat where everything is super brightly lit. And I would not be using Shadow Blade if I got caught in magical darkness. Those aren't the times I want to use it. I want to use it when I can get that dim light condition. Furthermore, whenever I use my Action Surge, Ideally, I want to be using it when I've got my Shadow Blade up, because my damage is significantly higher when I'm using Shadow Blade. So that means that Action Surge is going to boost our damage more when we're doing it in the combats where we're using our Shadow Blade. And just to remind you, we see a huge boost at this character's damage at level 7, and that's because of Aura Magic. And then we see a huge boost again at level 8. That's a little bit because of our Dexterity boost, but it's actually primarily because of Shadow Blade. Even though we're only doing it out of two combats out of every eight, that one quarter of the time that we're using Shadow Blade actually improves our damage a fair amount. Also just want to point out, at this point, we're looking at four first level spell slots. That's a reasonable amount of castings. That means we can use a number of shields, a number of absorb elements. We can replace our familiar when we need to. Are we going to be running out of first level spell slots? Yeah, we're going to be running out of first level spell slots probably every day. But it is likely to be well within the adventuring day by the time that happens. We see we have a plus five dexterity save, plus six constitution save, plus one wisdom save, we don't want to be leaving that wisdom save at plus one. So I'm going to jump up to level 12. Let's talk about what happens up to level 12. At this point, this is the last point where we're still limited to second level spells. At ninth level, we're going to get Indomitable. This is going to give us the ability to reroll a saving throw that we miss. Once again, our saving throws aren't bad. I mean, our constitution saving throw is quite good. Our dexterity saving throw is decent as well. Wisdom's not great. Uh, and I'll say that Indomitable can be not all that great in some cases. I've seen fighter builds where they're counting on Indomitable to make their saving throws decent. But if you don't have good base saves, getting a reroll isn't always a big deal. I mean, if you are making a wisdom save against a charm effect, and you have a plus one to your save, or a zero to your save, and the DC something like an 18 or a 19, this is not unusual to happen once we get into these levels, 
Indomitable just means that you're probably going to fail again. We need to get that base save higher. We also get Eldritch Strike. Eldritch Strike is going to give us the ability to provide disadvantage on a saving throw when we hit somebody with a weapon attack. Thing is, is that the spells that we get through Eldritch Knight are not the types that are generally going to get a huge bonus out of Eldritch Strike. That's not necessarily a bad thing. We don't necessarily want to be providing a lot of saving throws. I much prefer spells that I can rely on. But Eldritch Strike, there it is, and that's what it does. Now, we get extra attack at 11th level. That means we're going to be able to make three attacks if we make the attack action. I will tell you that we are still better off doing Green Flame Blade and Booming Blade and just using our War Magic for that bonus action attack. The one time we might find that extra attack is now delivering more damage than with Green Flame Blade or Booming Blade is if we have a Shadow Blade. If we have a Shadow Blade, being able to make those three attacks is now delivering as much damage, even a little bit more than if we did Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade. That's probably the way I would go. Though the, again, the difference isn't huge. Green Flame Blade and Booming Blade just scaled again at level 11. So this doesn't become a huge difference in damage. And then we're going to grab our feet at level 12. It's going to be Resilient Wisdom. That's going to give us the final of our three primary saving throws to be five or higher. Now these aren't astounding saving throws, I've made lots of builds with better saving throws than these, but for a fighter, these are decent saving throws. At 10th level, you're going to get an additional cantrip. I'm going to recommend the light cantrip. We want to be able to control lighting to some degree with this character. The light cantrip is a way we can do that. If we even use our familiar to deliver light to the battlefield using the light spell, they can ensure that you're in that dim light area where you want to be when we're using Shadow Blade. We're going to be able to use Shadow Blade three times at 10th level. We definitely want to be taking advantage of the dim light advantage that Shadow Blade gives us. Otherwise, it's not giving us nearly the boost in damage that it should be. 13th level, just going to go over really quickly. We're going to get a second use of Indomitable, and it is better now because we have decent saving throws for all our three primary saves. That reroll when we're unlucky has a much better chance of working. We also now have the ability to cast third level spells. We're going to get two of them a day. Counter spell is yet another reaction spell we can do. Because we don't have a fantastic intelligence score, if we're trying to counter spell really high level spells, like 8th or ninth level spells, our chance isn't great. But I'll tell you what, I'll take that chance. It's worth it. If we can potentially stop a ninth level spell using our reaction, that's worth a third level slot. I also want to mention that if we have another character in the party that uses Counterspell, we might also have another use of Counterspell that's far more reliable. So let's say we have an enemy and that enemy is a super high level and they're going to cast a ninth level spell. Our primary spellcaster is going to try to counterspell that spell, and they get counterspelled. Well, then we can counterspell the counterspell, and that will probably be reliable. And I'm going to take Fireball. Uh, now, Fireball at 13th level is no big deal anymore. At 5th level, Fireball is huge. 13th level, doing 86 damage, save for half. In most cases, this is a small percentage of an enemy's hit points. But we get a bunch of enemies together, that's still a lot of damage. More damage than we can do attacking them one at a time. First thing that will happen at 14th level is we're going to get an ability score increase. I am recommending the lucky feat at this point. This really boosts up our defense. We can take a critical hit against us. We can't use a shield against it. We can use the lucky feat against it. Second thing is, is if we are failing a saving throw, we have Indomitable, usable twice a day. It's not a guarantee. Lucky to give us yet another saving throw reroll. Now we can use Lucky to increase our offense as well by turning a miss into a potential hit. Probably not the way I'd use it. I'd probably be using it as a defensive boost. Our offense is doing just fine. Now at 14th level, we're also going to get a third level spell, and that can be from any school we want. And there are a lot of choices here that I think are worthwhile choices. If you don't have a method to fly, I think fly is a really strong choice here. I'm going to be going ahead and taking the haste spell with this character just to continue our focus on combat improving spells. Haste gives us a plus two bonus to armor class. Armor class is already reasonably good. We have the ability to cast shield on top of that and another plus two with haste that all stacks together can give us a very strong armor class. 
Also advantage on dexterity saving throws. Dexterity saving throws are not our strongest save, but we're decent at them. You get advantage on that, and that can really easily turn a miss saving throw into a success. And then we get an additional action on our turn. The first turn of combat, all we're going to get is a single weapon attack, unless we want to take the dash, disengage, hide, or use an object action. But as of the second turn of combat, we're going to be getting an additional action each turn that we can use for an additional rapier stab. Because the first round has less damage, and the second, third, and fourth round have more damage, but not a huge amount more damage, what we find is haste isn't a huge damage bonus for the day, especially once we divide it by the number of combats we're going to be using it by. But haste has more than just a damage boost. It is also boosting our armor class. It's also boosting our dexterity saving throws. It's also boosting our slower movement speed, uh, which can be an issue in combat tactically. So haste is giving us a number of things. And the additional stab we can get with a haste is kind of going to be our default, but we do have some additional options for it as well. However, I do not think that haste is required for this character. If you are in a campaign and you're going to need to be able to fly reasonably often, take the fly spell. You're going to find it more useful than haste, and it's not going to affect your DPR in a significant way. If you are finding the need to teleport, take the thunderstep spell. You will have no problem with your DPR. Haste is just one of those options. So when do we use haste with this character? Well, assuming an eight combat day, I would be expecting to use Shadow Blade in three combats. That gives us five combats left. Two of them, we will be using haste. That means five out of eight combats per day, we could expect to be concentrating on a spell. Now we have third level spells as our maximum level spell, right to level 19. So I just wanna quickly go over what happens between level 14 and right through level 20 with this character. First thing I should mention is that at level 17, we're gonna get an additional use of our Action Surge and Indomitable. So that is a, both the offensive boost of Action Surge and the defensive boost of Indomitable on top of our cantrip scaling at that level. And remember, we are using our cantrips over our extra attack. Most fighters don't see a big offensive boost at 17th level, but with Eldritch Knights, you do. And I should mention that 17th level is not a bad jump point. If you wanted to do something else besides fighter, 17th level is a level where I would consider doing that because we're actually not getting a huge amount from levels 18, 19, and 20. At 15th level, we get a nice ability called Arcane Charge. When we use our Action Surge, and remember we're getting a second use of that at 17th level, we get to be able to move 30 feet to an unoccupied space we can see using our action surge. Uh, now, remember that I said we would be using our action surge when we're using Shadow Blade? That continues, that continues right to 20th level. So that means that we will probably be using this ability in combats where we're using Shadow Blade. And remember, Shadow Blade is a tactical spell. We wanna be sitting in the right lighting conditions. Arcane Charge is a way to help us achieve that if we find ourselves out of position. Now, with our ability score improvements, at level 16, I'm recommending Bountiful Luck. This is a way we can use our Halfling feature to help other party members. Uses our reaction. We will not be using our reaction in combat all the time. Bountiful Luck is going to be filling a lot of those gaps because our allies are going to be rolling ones, and when they do, we can use our Bountiful Luck and a reaction to allow them to re-roll. And at level 19, I'm recommending Medium Armor Master. We could also go with the Constitution Boost here, or the Tough Feet. I think those are both good options, but Medium Armor Master is going to increase our armor class by one. And because we have the Stealth Skill and a good Dexterity, being able to remove the disadvantage on Stealth Checks using our Half Plate means that we're actually going to be a good Stealth character. At 18th level, we're going to get Improved War Magic. This helps us a little bit when we cast Haste. When we use our action to cast a spell, we can make one weapon attack as a bonus action. Because when we cast haste in the first round of combat, normally we can only make one weapon attack using the hasted action we get in that first round of combat. Improved War Magic is going to come into effect there. And finally, at 20th level, we're going to get our capstone. That's our fourth attack using our attack action. And as usual, it's not something we're going to be using much of. With Shadow Blade, probably worth it to do the extra attack. But again, it doesn't make a huge difference, except on round one when you cast the Shadow Blade. 
And the final two spells we're going to take with this character, at 19th level we're going to take Fire Shield, it fits within our Evocation Abjuration limitation, it's a 10 minute non-concentration spell, so we can combine this with our Haste or with our Shadow Blade, and it's going to give us resistance to a damage type, and if we're hit with an attack, and I don't expect we'll be hit with a lot of attacks, but when we are hit with an attack, we can deliver a little bit of damage to a melee attacker that did that damage. With a 10 minute duration, we can expect this to last for multiple combats. Then we're also going to get Greater Invisibility. You're only going to have one 4th level spell slot, so if you're going to use it on Greater Invisibility, I would only use it in a case where I have the ability to cast outside of combat. So if we have a round of preparation, that's when I would want Greater Invisibility. It's going to give me advantage on every attack I make, and it's going to give disadvantage on any attack against me. So it's a big offensive and defensive boost. It also prevents you from being targeted with a number of spells. But if no combats are coming up where I have the chance to prepare beforehand, then I might just use my 4th level slot on the Fire Shield. So if we think about it, we now have three different spells we're using for concentration and combat. We're going to have three slots per day that we will be using on Shadow Blade. We will end up with three slots a day we will be probably using on haste and an additional slot a day will be doing greater invisibility that's seven out of eight combats a day so in almost every combat we can expect to be concentrating on something it also depends on our tactics which spell we're doing when can i cast before combat greater invisibility can i get the right lighting conditions shadow blade are none of those things going to come up for me haste it gives me a fair bit of tactics involved in what spell I cast when. To me, this is a little more interesting than just having a character that goes into combat, they roll d20s for attack rolls. Those characters are boring to me. Characters that can think about which spell they want to cast and when they want to cast it and combine that with attack rolls is far more interesting to me. One of the reasons I like playing Eldritch Knights, and one of the reasons I think Eldritch Knights get a raw deal by people who think that they're one of the weaker fighter subclasses. I mean, I can make a fighter from any subclass and beat the baseline. That's not hard to do, and I can do it with Eldritch Knight from level 1 through 20, and it's not hard to do. What is hard to do is to use a non-variant human and a shield and still be able to deliver this much above the baseline from level 7 through 20. But this character can do it, and it relies primarily on spellcasting. Spellcasting is vital for this character to be delivering this kind of damage. And it's important to be thinking about our tactics, our positioning in combat, where is the lighting, do I have the chance to prepare for combat, if I don't, which spell am I going to cast? Do I want to be using Booming Blade, do I want to be attacking twice with my Shadow Blade? These are all tactical decisions we get to make with this character that we don't necessarily get to make with other kinds of fighters, and I like that. And we get to be effective on top of that. So that's my Eldritch Knight build. Next week, we'll be looking at the Arcane Trickster, and once again, we're going to be looking at a small-sized character, so I hope you'll join me then. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.